So let's hear what Professor Day has to say about uh, where are the LGBT scientists, not all scientists, wear white coats. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of really great to be here and quite nerve-wracking to be here. As Ronan says, I've not talked on this topic before, so it's the first time I've given a sort of talk like this. Um, and so hopefully there'll be a few things in it that make you think a little bit. And I want to reflect really on my experiences as a gay scientist, but also the culture of science and how accepting that is or not accepting that is, and things that we can think about doing either as individuals or institutions to perhaps change the perceptions of that. Um, and you'll see as we go through that these purple shoes are quite important to me. They've been quite an important part of my journey, and, and that's why I'm wearing them today. Um, so, actually, if you ask where are all the LGBT scientists, there's one who nearly the whole country knows now, which is pretty impressive, right? Thanks to the work of Stonewall and Gay History Month activities and things all around the country, most people could name this man as Alan Turing and would know that he played a vital role in the war effort, developing the Enigma machine, and was a gay scientist who sadly uh, ended up dying in the 1950s. And he set a legacy for LGBT science, if you like. And it was when thinking about his legacy and things like Gay History Month and so on, I started to think, well, where's his legacy gone? Who are the influential gay scientists that have followed on from Alan Turing and, and trodden his footsteps as scientists who happen to be LGBT? And so that was the question that I started out by asking. Who are the still living LGBT scientists who are out there? What are they influencing? What are they doing? And so on. So I'm pretty like a student when I have a question like that. And the first thing that I do is type it into Google or Wikipedia. And if you look for like scientists on Google, this is what you find on Google Images. This is what a scientist is, right? This is what they look like. They're often men. Um, they're often white, they're often middle-aged, I mean, all of those things, and they're often, if they're chemists, pouring things from one test tube to another, and would be serious, concentrated, or a focus. That's, that's the image of a scientist, typically, the stereotype of a scientist. Now, the RSC, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and other scientific bodies have done a lot to try and break this stereotype, historically, because it's really damaging to science in all sorts of ways that are probably obvious. And so one of the most famous ways that the Royal Society of Chemistry tried to break this stereotype was to point out that not all chemists wear white coats, which was where the idea for the title of this talk came from. And your chemist could be um, diving and collecting chemicals from the bottom of the sea and investigating them. They could be doing atmospheric research in the polar regions. They could be working on an oil rig in a sort of chemical engineering role or they could be towing a boat through a jungle doing very important chemistry, obviously. And chemists are out there doing a whole diverse range of things. But what the Royal Society of Chemistry didn't really talk about very much in this campaign was uh, LGBT issues or anything like that. But it's a step in the right direction okay, in terms of portraying a broader range of scientists doing a broader range of different things. So... I went back and rather than looking for what is a scientist, what's the stereotype of a scientist, I looked for gay scientists to find out where they were and what they were doing. And so you do that exercise, and this is what you get. Um, this is if you search Wikipedia for LGBT scientists from the UK, and you get a reasonable looking list of names, okay, for people who are LGBT in science. So then you can kind of interrogate that list in a little bit more detail, and what you find out is that quite a lot of them are dead. Um, so that's Sir Edwin Backhouse, Jane Harrison, John Maynard Keynes, very famous, probably known for everybody, economist, counts as scientist in this context. Okay? Peter Landin, WJH Sprott, Alan Turing is on this list, and Colin Turner. So there's a good handful that weren't dead. So I investigated them. Well, another one was dead and actually never even worked as a scientist. So they were a journalist through their whole career. I couldn't find any connection to science whatsoever. Um, John Wells is retired from science, as really is Simon LeVay, is semi-retired, kind of, does a little bit of science. So. Uh, so that left me with two names on the list. It might be a bit hard to read from the back. Well, the first one is someone I like very much. Um, that's Evan Davis from Radio 4's Today programme. 
He's one of the most influential gay scientists in the UK. Of course, he trained as an economist, so he's on the list for his economics, um, but really, fundamentally, he's a, he's a journalist and a, and a business correspondent. So again, I wouldn't count him as a scientist. And that brings you down to one scientist left. And this is a proper card-carrying scientist. Sophie Wilson is a transgender scientist, um, developed the ACORN computers, and wrote a lot of the computer programming that underpins the ARM um, protocols for computing. And there's a huge range of fantastic work done by Sophie. And actually, I've reflected on a bit of this stuff on, on YouTube, and I got contacted by uh, Sophie's nephew, who I happened to actually teach at York, who gave me a lot of the background information about Sophie Wilson, and said she was absolutely tickled pink to be the only living LGBT UK <laughs> scientist, according to Wikipedia. And she was quite delighted by that. So I thought, well, this can't be, can't be right, right? There can't be so few LGBT scientists in the UK, and Wikipedia is not a very good source to any students in the room. It's not how you should put your <laughs> essays together, right? So I thought, well, I'll look at what the LGBT community kind of thinks and what general society thinks about scientists and, and sort of important people. And so I decided to do a bit of a competition between Time magazine as a reflection of general culture and the Independence Pink List from last year as a reflection of LGBT culture and important people who are LGBT. I thought I'd look at what the people did on the Time List and what the people did on the Pink List and see whether they were similar or different. So when you do this analysis, and there's a lot of data on here, so I'm going to like talk through it in a simplistic way. Time magazine and the independent ping list. But if you group with data, you'll see where this is going already. So on the Time magazine list, there's quite a lot of people working in politics and business, as you'd expect. Very influential, half the list. Scientists make up about 10% of the list. That includes people working in technology and engineering. Arts and media is sort of 15, 20%. Sports sits at about 10%. And then little bits of education and royals and military and those kind of things. Now, when you look at the independent pink list, it's a very different makeup. So there's a lot more activists and charity workers in this red sector on the independent pink list. Now, part of the reason for that is the pink list decided to take out politicians as a separate category and had a separate list of about 25 politicians last year. So there were very few politicians on this list. Right? There were stacks of media people. And I think this reflects, of course, the fact they have a lot of influence. Um, because people see them in the media, but I think it also reflects a lot of stereotypes about what LGBT people do for a living. Arts, culture, singing, dancing, drama, etc., etc. You'll notice that sport actually does okay on the pink list. There's been a real concerted effort to have LGBT role models in recent years. People, Nick Adams, and Gareth Thomas, and Tom Daly, etc., etc. There's a lot of people who kind of stood up and and made a bit of an issue of saying, well, I'm a sports person and I'm LGBT and it's not an issue. And that's reflected very well in this list. But really the issue was science here. There were no scientists on the independent pink list, which would suggest that either there's very low visibility of scientists who are gay, or the gay community doesn't really value what goes on in the scientific community. It's difficult to unpick which of those is the reason for this low amount of science. And here, uh, I, I count this as 1%. One of these was a psychologist working in a, a university setting, and there was a person who writes about technology as a journalist. They were a tech journalist, so I count that as half a percent. Um, so, so this begs the question about the sort of representation of, of scientists, really. And so I made a YouTube video about that and uh, on my YouTube channel and reflected a little bit about that process, and that kick-started quite a lot of discussions and conversations, and it might even be one of the reasons that I'm here today, because I started reflecting on that survey in that YouTube video. Um, and I'm not the only person who's kind of picked up on that. There was an article in The Guardian uh, about two weeks ago, written by Tom Welton, who's at Imperial College, he's a chemist at Imperial College, London head of department down there, um, and in his... This is a quote from his Guardian, and he said, gay scientists are almost completely invisible, and in his view, part of the blame for this lies with the LGBT community, which doesn't really look at science or think about science. That was his view. And uh, when he published this article, it got a lot of comments uh, online, and some from scientists, some not from scientists, a few supportive, mostly either indifferent or hostile. 
And this was a pretty typical comment on his article. Um, you're mistaking us for people who give A. Um, your sexuality is not important vis-a-vis your job. It was a pretty typical attitude that was expressed underneath the article. And I'd say the same is true of sports people. The sexuality of the sports person is not relevant to the, whether they're a good sports person or a bad sports person. But there has been seen to be a need for role models in that area who are LGBT. But this was a pretty common comment. And if you looked at scientists' thoughts on diversity and equality that came through on the article that Tom wrote, um, this was one, I've been a scientist in London, California, Canada, and Oregon, currently Massachusetts, and there's, I've had gay colleagues, some are successful, some are not successful, it's not a big deal. And I think actually this is true of a lot of scientists in this way. Um, uh, this could be unbiased acceptance. Of course, you could view it as, oh yes, yeah, some of my best friends are gay. It's not an issue, you know, you get about it. Kind of thing. Uh, so your fellow scientists don't give a shite about your sexuality, just your research credentials and publication records. Isn't that a quality? It's, again, a typical reflective comment that came through on this article. So it, is it that science is just this meritocracy, right, where you are simply what you achieve, and that's all that matters, you are your talent, or is it kind of, look, just don't ask, don't tell, don't talk about this issue, we don't really want to discuss it, we'd rather just talk about science, to be quite honest. And you can again view that as being either way around. And this was a comment from an LGBT scientist that was interesting, I'm gay, and a scientist has nothing to do with my work, uh, it's never had an influence on my social life, or my sexuality hasn't had any impact on my work. Articles like this do a disservice to both the LGBT community as well as the scientific community. So you can imagine I read that and then I was like triply nervous about coming here and having this discussion this evening, right? Because it doesn't set you up uh, to feel particularly welcomed to talk about this kind of issue and to open it up. So I wanted to think about the environment that we work in, those of us that work in a university, and specifically uh, within STEM, um, because I think there is generally less uh, out STEM colleagues than other areas of work. And this is my environment that I grew up in, right? So this was my um, bog standard comprehensive in South Manchester where I was growing up and these were my friends. Um, and of course I was at school in the 80s and it was a very different era, right? As we all know, the environment was pretty bad then. Uh, there was a teacher who was thought to be gay by the students so I thought he called him a bummer and shouted that down the corridor at him. And I remember being in a lesson where one of the students put their hand up and said, you got AIDS yet, sir? Um, to his face, in the lesson. That was standard when I was growing up in school, in the environment I grew up in. That was not unusual. Right? So that was how the environment was. Now it's, it's massively different to that now for kids growing up today. Things are still said, of course, but that was, that's the environment. And kids this age, I was probably about 14, 15, I guess. I'm not in this picture, by the way. I was taking this I know, there was no way I was putting up a picture that included me in <laughs> age 14 or 15. Not a chance. Um, but these were my friends. Um, and these were the people who kind of looked out for me. And I, I never came out when I was at school. I mean, I just wouldn't have done in that environment. So this is where I work now. So this is York uh, Research Building and our brand new teaching labs. A little bit of a plug there. Um, and what about academia then? How is the environment? So... There was a really nice survey done. Now, it's not a UK survey, unfortunately. It was done in the USA, and attitudes are a bit different in the USA, perhaps, to the UK. Uh, but I do want to talk about global things a little bit. Um, and in this survey, they looked at LGBT people working in STEM, and they asked them how out they were in a variety of different contexts. So they asked about to friends and family, going from less out to more out, and basically, uh, this is Jeremy Yoder's uh, survey from Minnesota, but it's people from all over America primarily. And actually, most of the people that filled in this survey were completely out to friends and family, or, or on the more out end of the spectrum. But when you translate that into a work environment for these people, that changes completely, right? And although there are some who clearly are confident and fully out at work, it's pretty much an on-off thing, and most people are either out or not out at all, uh, with a fading spectrum in between to colleagues and a very similar pattern to students. Um, so what this tells you is that at least the people who filled in this survey are pretty comfortable to be out to friends and family, but uncomfortable in being out in the workplace. And these are all people that work in STEM. Um, and 
to me, that probably doesn't reflect a particularly healthy workplace, particularly this. And these are people that you're working with day in, day out, having discussions with them about you know, where you're off on holiday, what you're doing in your life. And this actually surprised me. And so he then asked those people whether their workplace was welcoming and graded it against whether they were out or not out. To see, and of course there's a push me and pull you thing here. It could be that the people who come out feel that their workplace is more welcoming, right? So the more out people rate this as more welcoming, whereas the less out people up here rate this as hostile. So these are the hostile responses, and generally these people are less out. Whereas the people who find their workplace welcoming tend to be more out. And people who were not sure what their workplace was like, and this is really important, the people who were not sure really were not out at all. So if people don't know what the workplace is going to respond to them with, then they're not going to come out. And then how supportive is your employer? A very similar pattern, basically. Although generally people felt their employers were more supportive than their workplaces were welcoming, but if people were more out, they generally felt they were supported as well as their straight colleagues. And if they were less out, they were supported not so well. Um, so what about the environment where I work? Well, I'm kind of very lucky in this regard. And this is one of the reasons that it's, it's an easy department to talk about this kind of issue in. Uh, so we're in a Athena Swan Gold Award holding department. So for those of you that don't work in universities and don't work in STEM, you won't have heard of this before. But one of the issues that science, technology, and engineering and maths have is with women in science. It's probably a bigger issue than LGBT issues, to be honest. And one of the things that's done is departments can put in for Athena Swan status that shows how they support the careers of women in science and think about diversity issues in science. And our department's done a lot of work in this area and has a gold award in terms of attitudes towards women in science. And a lot of the thinking that you do about diversity and women in science is very transferable to issues like LGBT people in science. And because the department I work in is a pretty supportive place and tends to see people as people, that is a genuine feeling I get from the department, I decided to do a survey on some of our undergraduate students about how they felt about being LGBT students within the department, what the place was like, what the environment was like for them. And so I asked them a number of questions. I'm not going to present the answers to all of them. I'm just going to focus on a few key ones. But I want to know if the department was safe and supportive. Um, if they had LGBT-specific issues, would they discuss them with their personal supervisors or would they approach someone else? Uh, how could we better support these students? And I asked them whether having out LGBT members of staff, of which we have a few at York, made any difference to them as LGBT students. Because, of course, this goes back to the idea that well, really all that matters is our science, our personal lives are irrelevant, and whether we're gay or not is irrelevant. And so, really looking in at question four, students uh, gave some really quite incredible responses about the effect that being in a department without members of staff and other out students have. Uh, so, I mean, they said it was important, they could see that they could go higher up and do great things. Uh, definitely, in my opinion, it's the same as anything in society. If you see influential individuals in positions you admire or would like to do, it makes things seem achievable. Um, gives a very good impression of LGBT people to others, helping overcome stereotypical views about what LGBT people can do. And perhaps these were the comments that I liked the most, um, or was most pleased by, you know, that having LGBT role models within the department, this is staff and students, certainly helped my own coming out process. It made me feel that like this is two different people. It made me feel a lot better in the first year, having come from a school where LGBTQ welfare was swept under the carpet and there were next to no out students or teachers. Um, and so clearly, at least from our, this is undergraduates and graduates perspective, there was some value to the fact that some of us in the department had talked about these kind of issues and then had gone and asked them about these kind of issues. They were also pleased to see that they were being asked their opinion about these things. And so the kind of things the department is very good at doing in York is disseminating these things. And so this was put in our departmental newsletter. So this is a way of then highlighting it to all students within the department, all staff within the department, that we've been surveying LGBT students, and there was a long article about this. And then this was also picked up 
by the student campus newspaper that this had been going on and was talked about. And I know other departments have started looking at similar things in York, and actually the university has started its own <coughs> diversity survey on the back of this. And so there's quite a lot of kind of traction you can get out of quite a small act of simply asking people that I knew were in that position. And the way I organized the survey was very simple. <coughs> I knew one of our student reps was gay. Um, it was not a secret. And I went to him and I said, I want these questions asked around our students in the department. Can you organize it for me? And then you come back to me anonymously. Okay? And so he went to everyone he knew who was LGBT in the department, gave them the survey, and the answers came back to him or to me. Um, and then we compiled them. So it's really simple to do through just one contact. So this is the comment you get most as a scientist, that your sexuality is totally irrelevant to scientific <coughs> research. And it is, most of the time. But I wanted to tell you a personal story uh, about my research, just a very short one, because I know you're not all scientists. And I wanted to show you how I've my research isn't irrelevant to my sexuality and how I put my research in context um, this is relevant and it comes back to the shoes really the shoes have been a great way in to this topic for me um, so if I was thinking about my personal research, research story it all kind of starts here some of it starts here uh, so I always say when I go out and talk to school kids or when I present this to our undergraduates um, I say uh, this is a picture of me uh, my partner, it's kind of obvious from this picture that I'm gay. I mean, who else would wear purple shoes, right? <laughs> That's the giveaway. And, and so this is my partner, Sam. And a lot of, sort of the research that we're doing is inspired by kind of things that I've come across while knowing Sam. And this is on the day of our civil partnership. Um, I think this was the day after our civil partnership when York flooded as a probably direct result of... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sitting, sitting on the Vinci steps the day before being photographed. I'm sure uh, Archbishop Centenary wasn't keen. Um, but yeah, this does. And you can, uh, you can see a lot of things from this. You can see that again, you can see this is my partner. You can see this is the closest you can get to being married in your Minster. Uh, but the one thing you can't see is that Sam has cystic fibrosis. In this picture, um, he has lung damage, and this is an x ray, and these white squiggly bits are scarring on his lungs. And so, when I met Sam, I got quite interested in like, the science around cystic fibrosis. Because if somebody you know really well is suffering from something, you kind of think about the science of that. You just do. It's natural. Anyway, in about 2011, early, no, late 2010 actually, um, Sam's lungs were really very seriously damaged. And this was him on oxygen 24 hours a day. Um, and basically, when you get to this stage, the only thing that can sort you out is a transplant. You have to have a transplant uh, to remove the totally damaged lungs and replace them. And so that's what Sam did. The next picture is a little bit graphic, but bear with it. This is Sam, 24 hours after a lung transplant. This is probably the most epic selfie ever taken. Um, he wanted to know what was in his neck. He goes, there's something in my neck. There's something in my neck. I said, yeah, you're right. There's something in your neck, definitely. And so he took this selfie, and it's quite useful because... This is what I was looking at as a scientist. I was looking at the oxygen going in to keep his lungs oxygenated. And I was looking at the heart monitor, monitoring that. I was looking at this neck thing going in that he was so worried about, and loads of drugs going in uh, to Sam's neckline. And obviously, if you spend all your time looking at these and talking to the doctors and surgeons, which I did, about all these drugs, right, then you have quite a grumpy husband at the end of the day. Um, but one of the drugs that they were using was heparin. And so this is how I move from that context of my sexuality into the research that we're doing. Because what we realised is heparin is used as an anticoagulant in surgery. Surgeons told me all about it. And as a chemist, I knew it was made of molecules. And I also knew that all these red bits, these oxygen atoms, were negatively charged. Right? And what I'd spent the last 10 years of my career doing was trying to understand how to bind things that were negatively so well, that was quite interesting. I could make something that could bind to that molecule, um, stick to it. And then the doctor said, well, the real problem once surgery is complete is you have to give patients a protamine because you have to remove the heparin. You see, the real problem is this is used to keep the blood nice and thin during the surgery. And when you wheel the patient back to the ward, you want them to clot 
And so you have to give them an antidote to get rid of the heparin. And they use this. But the problem is it has loads of side effects. I said, oh, right, OK. How does it work? And they said, oh, it's a molecule, quite a big molecule, biological molecule, with lots of positive charges on it. Right? Everybody knows positively charged things bind to negatively charged things. Right? It's, it's kind of strange to come to do an LGB talk and to talk about heteronormative chemistry. Like <laughs> <laughs> right? But that's how it is. After that, you know, we understand this, and we, we can make something better than this without the side effects. And so that's kind of what we've done in our research. And I'm not going to tell you much of the story at all, because it's not the point. But we made a system which had positively charged bits and which was designed in such a way that it would spontaneously assemble into a little nano-sized ball. And then you'd be able to inject that into the patient's bloodstream, and it would bind to the heparin, mop it all up after surgery, and act as an antidote to the anticoagulant. And so what we're trying to make is replacements for the protamine that causes all the side effects. And this is what it looks like. We put it in a computer, and we model it. And I work as part of a huge team, something that I'll come back to later. This is modeled by Sabrina in Italy. This is our nano-sized ball binding to the heparin. So we're convinced from a computer that it works. We also work with a team here in Liverpool, Jerry Turnbull's team in the Institute of Biology. And he helps us look at the coagulation of this system. And he's a heparin expert, right? And what he allowed us to see is that when we take our system, we add heparin, it stops the clotting, and then we add our antidote, and it starts the clotting again. So our molecule works just as well as the protein. And we're now developing this molecule as a potential post-surgical treatment alongside our collaborative team. And so that's the context that I put my research into. That's how I present it to research conferences. That's how I go out and talk about it in outreach lectures. Um, and the other thing that I did is I called our self-assembled multivalent system Samuel. <laughs> and you can do things uh, when, when you do this as a scientist you can go out and speak about this because this is the kind of story that people want to hear about so this was in the York Press um, a couple of weeks ago uh, Partners Transplant of Inspired Breakthrough you cannot believe Sam nearly killed me uh, <laughs> and I gave a picture to the York Press and they said he has given you his permission for that picture hasn't he and I showed him a whole load of pictures and I'm doing this piece for the press and we're going to use one of the pictures. Right? And he said, oh, it's all right, don't worry about it, whatever, whatever. And then this came out, like page seven of the paper or whatever, and it's, it was big. I mean, in the paper, there's a full-page spread, and he was not happy. And we went down the local shops, and even the butcher recognised him and said, that was you in the paper, wasn't it, with those things in your neck? So, um, but, but, you know, that has some, some impact. Uh, it's interesting, when you go out and talk to the press about these things, strange things can happen, like there's little wrinkles along the way. Uh, that you have. And sometimes they're inadvertent, and sometimes they're advertent as a gay scientist. So this is an inadvertent example. I did a little interview um, for a magazine which will remain nameless, I think. Um, and I was very careful to say in the interview, because I always try and mention it if it fits to the interview. The reason for heparin in particular is because my partner had a lung transplant about two years ago, and when I was sat at his bedside, I talked a lot to the surgeon that they did and by the time it got to the print edit, that had become, my partner had a lung transplant about two years ago, and I talked a lot to the surgeons about what they were doing. And the gender of my partner had been removed from the article. Okay. Now, that was inadvertent, because I said to them, oh, why did you do that? You know, why did you remove it? Because there's so few examples where people talk about this kind of stuff. Um, but they said it was just that they needed to edit the length, right? So it just went. But it's a shame, right? There are things that are more advertent. So uh, when I went to one of the awards dinners that Alan mentioned, this was the table plan, and you've got Professor David Smith and his <laughs> lovely wife, Samantha. Um, <laughs> at which point I pointed out that you know, when I said Sam Smith, it was a, my accompanying partner, I meant Sam Smith, and they wouldn't be very happy to see the name Samantha there. And they said, oh, but it would be wonderful for her to have a full name put on there. You know, it's a formal event, and I wanted to use the proper names. I said, well, well, given the proper name is Samuel, and you've never seen a face drop as fast. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, you know, they knew they'd done wrong. Um, and, uh, and so they got the Tipex out, right? And they just went over that bit with Tipex on his name tag. And so it said Sam Tipex. <laughs> <laughs> um, so but, but this, isn't, this isn't big things. It's little things, right? It's just assumptions that people can make. Right? But these are really 
I think, kind of small fry in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, because when you think science has no problem with LGBT, one of the interesting things to think about is the global perspective of that. Right? We're in a very comfortable position in the UK. Um, we sit up here. It's you know, not the best place in the world for gay rights, but it's by no means the worst place for LGBT rights. And there are plenty of far worse places to go. Let's just say I haven't been invited to Saudi to do my lecture. Uh, I haven't been invited to Russia. I'm not sure how happy I feel going to give this lecture in those countries. The, not this one, but my research lecture that includes explicit mention of my partner. And I wouldn't change my lecture to go there. Um, and so to say science has no problem with LGBT, I'm not sure whether that's true. I'm not sure whether it's a bit complacent. I'm not sure if it thinks globally or not. It's quite interesting to look at the world in a different way. If you look at the world based on where the science is done, you perhaps begin to see why science thinks it's got no problem with LGBT. Because this is the globe according to science, right? And of course you've got bloated North America, bloated Europe, bloated Japan, and rapidly enlarging China. And these are all regions of the world that actually are either pro-LGBT rights or neutral on LGBT rights. And generally, roughly, the parts of the world with the worst records on LGBT rights are, are parts of the world that don't do very much science. So scientists tend not to meet other scientists that come from those parts of the world where they have the biggest problems. Yet scientists exist in all these countries, and I'm sure LGBT scientists exist in all these countries. And I think that if you were to go and say science has no problem with LGBT, all that matters is your science, your sexuality is irrelevant, if you were to go and say that to a lesbian academic in Saudi Arabia or a gay academic in Russia, they'd probably feel quite differently about that. They'd probably feel it did have a major impact on their ability to do research. So I do feel that it can be a little bit complacent to take that view. So as I've already said, I talk about these things in teaching, I talk about these things in outreach, it's exactly the kind of way I present science to groups of school kids uh, when I go out and talk about it. Um, and the other thing that I've done is made a whole series of YouTube videos on things that I think are interesting and the chemistry of the things I think are interesting. And that might be why Brian Cox um, can't do chemistry and is better at physics. That was what that video was about. Um, it's, there was some appalling chemistry in work of life. And uh, so that's something I was interested in. It might be about some semi-legal drugs that I think people would be interested in hearing about. It might be about HIV treatments and cures and AZT and triple therapy, which is something that I'm interested in. It might be the stories about the research that we've been doing in my own lab. And I just put out what I think is interesting to put out. And one of the things that a lot of scientists have said to me is, well, you know, I'm an LGBT scientist, but it's not relevant to my work, and I don't want it to be relevant to my work. I totally sympathise with that. Totally sympathise with that. I'm not going to build it into anything that I do academically. But I sort of want people to know. I just want a general background. I don't want to have to explain to people that's who I am. That's, you know... Because it's such a hidden diversity issue, being LGBT, generally. And so one of the most influential things that I did was started tweeting. And if you choose to tweet about a general range of things, that's a public domain record of what you're thinking about, interested in. Anybody can interrogate it. They don't have to have a Twitter account. Anybody can see it. And it's a very easy way of all your... I mean, all your students will look at this. Uh, if not all of them, enough of them will look at it that they'll talk to other students about what you're saying and, oh, did you say Dave said, see Dave said this or whatever. It's a very low-impact way of talking about your life with limited effort. This is a word from my Twitter account, so you can see the kind of things that I talk about. Chemistry. Great. You say, I'm really optimistic. That's the biggest word on my whole world. I didn't take any out. Uh, science, York, obviously. Students, good. Good students. I don't know whether those words really go together. Maybe they go together. Um, teachers. Um, yeah, public schools. I'm not me ranting. I'm not sure. Um, gay is definitely in there. Um, and... LGBT sits on there somewhere as well, uh, that and so on. So it's all just there. People make it what they will. Uh, it's a very easy way of individual scientists doing something about it. Um, oh, I also share awful pictures like this one when I get too drunk. So you've got to be really careful with the Twitter button. Otherwise, you end up sharing something like this 
of being laughed at by your husband. Uh, the other thing that I've done, and I recommend actually all scientists to do, irrespective of orientation, gender, whatever, is I think it's important that people see that we're people as well as scientists, right? There's all this stuff about this in my biography, it's on my website, it's what I give to people if I'm giving lectures now, and there's just this bit at the bottom, enter into a civil partnership with husband Sam, live in Central York, like cooking and travel. Just, this is a bit about me as a person. Um, and I'm now interested to see, I've started doing this about a year ago, and I'm interested to see, it's too early to say, how many places edit this out of the biography that goes up with the actual lecture, and how many places leave it in. That's a secret experiment that I'm performing <laughs> over the next few years to see whether that survives. But again, it's very easy to do, it's something that you control. More kind of nationally, there's some really good things going on that are worth knowing about. Um, so the Royal Society of Chemistry is really trying to push a whole range of diversity issues. And as a chemist, that's one of the ones I'm aware of. I'm sure there's similar things in physics. Um, and they're doing a 175 Faces of Chemistry campaign, which is including disabled scientists, lots of female scientists and their things, scientists in very different careers, scientists from ethnic minorities, there was uh, scientists that survived the Holocaust and continued as scientists, and I'm going to be one of the faces of this, talking about LGBT things in the next month or two. Um, and so the RSC, the Royal Society of Chemistry, is being very supportive at the minute of diversity issues to recognise the 175th anniversary, and this is being pushed from the very top of the Royal Society of Chemistry, which for the first time in its history has a female president. Now, if you go to America, they're a long way ahead on networking and things like this. So there's loads of professional society networks. So the ACS is, again, the American <coughs> Chemical Society Network, and they have professional networking activities. Uh, people can meet at conferences and LGBT groups. This is a very big conference series. About 15,000 people go. So this group has size and traction. People who are members of the ACS can join this group and get updates and so on. Um, and I think for professional societies to do this is also the right way to go, to just provide a space for people to talk in and to show that it's an acceptable thing. And I know there's people here from the institution who might be thinking, what can an institution like Liverpool do about this kind of thing? And this is absolutely the best single document on the web about LGBT plus and its physicists in particular. It's American again. I'd say a lot of the best work in this area is coming from America. Um, and it's about what you can do to support LGBT plus people in institutional things. And you'll see some of these things are things that they're doing here. Things like flagship lectures. Um, things like initiating and participating in surveys that we've talked about. Having LGBT champions or offering explicitly partner benefits in advertisements that mention LGBT couple partners. Uh, often in academic life, you have to recruit the academic, but also the partner is important as well. It's very common for a male academic to be asked about what does your wife do, is there any way the university can help with that kind of process? And thinking about just making sure that's LGBT sensitive is a very easy thing to do, avoiding assumptions, basically. Very flexible parenting policies are very important, increasingly for people who are LGBT. Um, and a university that doesn't try to stifle personal expression. Sometimes there's a push in universities to be increasingly corporate and for the web pages to all fit a model that lists your research grants and lists your publications and says little else. And I think if there's just some desire from a university to encourage personal expression, it is what we're all about at the end of the day. It's the point of universities and to have inclusive social events. Uh, it's a great document, it's well worth reading. So to finish, where are all the LGBT scientists and does it matter? I wanted to kind of finish with just a few quotes that I think sum that up. This was one thing that I got through Twitter that really surprised me, I guess. This was from a student in a very major UK metropolitan university where there's a thriving gay scene and you know it's a place you think that a lot of LGBT students or staff might be attracted to. And they said, except for rumour, we have zero LGBT staff or students here. It is quite isolated. This was from somebody via YouTube. Thank you for the video on gay scientists. It strengthened me in my wish to study chemistry. I often thought about it and always felt alone. I'm from Austria, where homosexuality is kind of hushed up. I was the only openly gay student at my school. I always felt strange pursuing a scientific career. 
There are very few role models in science. When I was growing up, you know, other than this guy, there's very few people you can look at and think, well, you know, they're doing it. You know. I start my studies in chemistry in the UK this year. I'm really looking forward to it. And from some students in York, a couple of other quotes, I say the department is definitely safe and supportive environment for LGBT students. I've never had any sort of problems during my time here, and it was this atmosphere that made it much easier for me to come out, especially after meeting other LGBT people within our year group. I think the department is very at ease with the LGBT community. I feel very safe here in York. And so I think these things do make a difference, actually, to students who are LGBT. And just putting that in a broader perspective to finish, I've got an article coming out uh, in Chemistry World, um, which the editor came up with this kind of nice title, No Sexuality Please, We're Scientists, for. Um, and I think this sums up the most important thing about diversity generally, not just LGBT. Because the worst aspect of arguing that only the science matters is that it undervalues us as individuals, LGBT or not. We all work in teams of scientists, and teams work best when they understand and support one another, strengths, celebrate differences, and diverse scientists are going to have diverse ideas and applications. If we want science to be at the cutting edge, to break the mould, to think about the world differently, we want diverse scientists who've had diverse experiences. And if those scientists are happy and fulfilled, they're going to perform better in the lab. If you're only judging scientists on their results, really it's not about individual scientists, it's about teams of scientists. And if you're judging teams of scientists on their results, you want them to be fulfilled, happy and diverse to achieve the best results. Because if we only care about the science and not the people who do it, we won't achieve the best. And nor will we be surprised if we continue to do that if the public rejects scientists as elite and removed from the realities of life and only really bothered about their little area that they study. So for me, that's the importance of diversity. Um, I'm obviously happy to discuss any of this with anybody. I'd like to thank Alan and Ronan for organising the talk and putting it on here in the chemistry department as well and hosting me today. And thanks a lot for coming and for your attention.